Hey everyone, I'm Amantech. This is my video about my D4 beta first impressions. I've played the game quite a bit during the early access period, and I actually had a really good time. I mostly played Rogue, and I had a little barbarian experience, but Rogue was the majority of the time that I played. Uh, I played Friday and also Saturday through the majority of the day, also while streaming on Twitch if you want to follow me over there. Uh, I streamed for about 10 hours a day, so I played about 20 hours worth of gameplay. Um, and this is kind of my first impressions. We're going to be looking at a couple different things, a little bit more in depth. Um, not entirely too close. We're not going to be looking at any of the story, but we're looking probably at some character customization, the world tiers, talking about a little bit of the gameplay, uh, looking at the map and like what we could do in the map and what we could do in the game that we currently have access to, as well as talking about some of my worries throughout the rest of the video. At the very end, we're going to be looking at my third time we kill the world boss. Uh, and a little bit of worries when it comes to that. Let's look at class selection and character customization. There are going to be five classes in D4, but three is only available during the early access period. There's quite a bit here for character customization. There's plenty of different skin tones, hairstyles, hair colors. Uh, one of the cool features that I did see is there's alopecia available for a skin tone. Towards the end, you can look at your makeup, the jewelry that your character wears, as well as markings. Markings are normally tattoos, but in this one, you're able to make it where it's paint, fresh blood, different scars, and I thought that was a pretty cool different change. So all in all, the customization of your character is pretty robust. Uh, it's not like the top tier, but it's actually serviceable for a Diablo game. Let's briefly talk about the world tier system. It looks like in the main game, there's going to be four different world tiers. But during the early access, we only have access to two, which is going to be World Tier 1 for Adventure and World Tier 2 for Veteran. Uh, world Tier 2 is a little bit more challenging. They have more experience and they drop more gold, whereas World Tier 1 is meant to kind of breeze through, kind of figure out what the story is. There is a statue in the middle of town where you are able to change the World Tier difficulty at any time. This type of system is pretty normal for a Diablo game. Basically, the higher you go, the harder enemies are, the more gold you get, and chances for better legendaries to drop. Pretty normal. All right, let's talk about the bulk of the game. You know, the gameplay. So there's a couple different things here. First of all, it's always online. You're always gonna be playing with other people. Uh, if you're not in a dungeon or a cellar or a stronghold or something that is specifically an instance content, you're always gonna be playing with other people, whether you're in a party with them or not. The negative with that is because you are always online, there is a chance that you're gonna get some stuttering here and there. Uh, you can see getting a little bit of the B-roll that I was trying to record, it actually like stopped in the middle of me doing an attack and then it tried to catch up. They do combat really well. Whenever I hit a big ability, it feels like I'm hitting that ability. The combat feels nice to me. Um, whenever I hit someone with like a small little dagger, it actually feels light because it's a pretty light attack, but I'm hitting really, really quick and it's, it's very responsive and very, very snappy. I love it a lot. One of my worries is whenever I played Destiny 2, there was always a lot of people playing and not a lot of enemies for me to kill. And since this is Diablo, I was a little worried that I wasn't going to be getting a lot of things. So with that, the map is actually very, very large. Uh, in the little spot that we were in the early access is just a small portion of the map, but it felt like I actually barely explored it. I didn't want to like, explore it in super, super detail, but it, it felt like I was able to like look at things at my heart's content and be happy. And with that, there's a bunch of enemies on the map. So I never felt like there was a lack of enemies that I needed to fight. And whenever I did go into somewhere where someone else was, there were still plenty of enemies. It seems like the spawns of the enemies are relatively quick where it doesn't feel empty. And that's pretty cool. One of my worries for the map is that because it's so large, it might feel empty. With that, there's plenty of things to do. So cellars, it seems like it's like a little one-off shoot for you to fight an elite or two and have a good time there. Then there's going to be dungeons. Throughout the world, there's these actual long form dungeons where you're able to go in, fight a bunch of monsters, beat a boss at the very end. And that's actually relatively fun. Also, at the end of the dungeon, when you beat it, you actually get this cool aspect that you're able to put on some weapons. We'll talk about that later on when it comes to the legendaries. Aside from that, there's also strongholds. Strongholds is kind of looks like end game or end area content where you're able to go take over this really big area with a bunch of enemies and when you beat the stronghold it seems like they turn into a town 
some with waypoints and some without waypoints. There was one though that actually didn't turn into a town. It turned into an area for a bigger public event. Uh, since the max level was 25, this public event was a level 30 plus public event with multiple people. So you all could gather up together and actually fight. We did a couple of those on our actual Twitch as well. Last two things in the open world is the Altars of Lilith and public events. So the Altars of Lilith is throughout the world. They're basically hidden permanent buffs for your account, not just for your character. If you find one and click it, you get a permanent thing for your entire account. And public events throughout the world, basically, you're going to be walking around and there's going to be a public event spawning in, right? You do that, you fight a bunch of enemies and you get some cool loot out of it. Pretty much it's a public event for a lot of these other games, such as, you know, Fates or public events in Destiny, where you fight a bunch and then you're able to do that. There's extra stuff you could do inside of the public event and it's called Mastery. It's very similar to the heroic system in Destiny. Those are the cool gameplay features we were able to access during the early access beta. So it seems there's quite a bit of content for when the main game comes out. And now a couple of the changes for your actual main character. So the first one is going to be the potion change. I thought it was kind of cool. It's basically now a charge system rather than just a cooldown system. Over time, you earn more charges in your potions and you're able to go to the potion vendor and actually level up your potion to heal for more. So that's kind of cool. Hello, potion seller. Something else they brought back is the skill tree. It actually seems a little bit daunting at first, but it's pretty easy. There's plenty of different things you're able to look at. Every level, you'll generate a skill point. You could put that in any of your skills. In your skill tree, you have basic skills, you have your core skills, some movement skills, some augmenting skills, and a couple other things. Each skill also has things branching off of its own self. Basically, it's a way to augment your skill if something else is there. So for example, I had something that whenever I attack someone, there was a small chance that I could make them vulnerable. Then another one that whenever I make them vulnerable and I kill them, it actually spreads the vulnerability out. A cool little feature I saw was a keyword selection, where basically if I wanted to find something, I will be able to click it and be like, cool, this has this specific keyword and I'm able to find those specific skills that I could work with. A major change that I saw is that if you put a point into a skill, you have access to that skill. Even though you have six active buttons at once, at any point, you're actually able to switch out your skills. All you have to do in the middle of combat, you're able to hit S, switch it out real quick, and you're able to change up your combat style to suit what you need to fight. Another new addition that they added was the renown system. Basically, everything you do in the game actually helps you push up your renown. Every stronghold you do, which will give you most renown, every waypoint you find, every piece of map uncovered, every altar of Lilith that you do in the world will actually push you up this renown. The more you do, you get access to more rewards. In the early access, there's a top reward for your current character that you get, which was most likely gold in experience. And the second thing is for all your characters on your account. For the early access, the first one was the skill point, the second one was an extra potion charge, and the third one was another skill point. So even though we were able to hit level 25, we were able to put 26 different skill points into our skill tree. So we were able to look up and try a couple different things. So legendaries, they did quite a bit with it this time. So every dungeon you do, you actually get an aspect of power, and that aspect of power gets stored in your codex of power. From that point on, you're actually able to select a rare item and actually put that aspect of power onto that rare item and it becomes a legendary. Now, that's not the only way to get an aspect. You actually could take a legendary, go to this vendor, remove the legendary effect from it, and then put it onto an item as well. However, it doesn't go into your codex of power, it goes into your inventory, which is something I didn't know when I first started playing. Regardless, I think this is a very cool way on how to do legendaries in this game. Now, this isn't the only way to look for legendaries. Um, and sometimes there are roles on legendaries that are actually better than what you have access to. I actually had a legendary aspect that was significantly better than the actual aspect that I currently had in my Codex of Power. I think the Codex of Power is 8%, whereas my bow had 24%. And you still could look for things like that. And the last thing I want to talk about is cosmetics. Whenever you find items in the world, you're actually able to pick them up, wear them, do everything like that, right? However, when you go over to salvage them, they actually become transmogable. You're able to go to the wardrobe and actually change the look on different things. 
it's actually a pretty cool system you're able to look at whatever helmet that you've already gotten you're able to select pigments and you're able to apply it to everything else and it's not applying to just the things you're wearing right now so if i change my chest plate later on in the world it's actually not going to change the look of my character you're also able to change the looks of your weapons including stuff to look like legendary weapons so i am excited that they're doing a bunch of things to change the cosmetic but to be fair it also gives me some pause since they're putting so much work and so much time into cosmetics it makes me a little worried about how they're going to monetize the game going forward we did already see there's going to be a season pass so is there going to be like really cool cosmetics that you're only going to get in the season pass or through purchasable things that you can't get in the world that look cooler and yeah it is cosmetic but it's still a worry in the back of my mind we don't want a diablo immortal situation you know did you guys not have phones yeah you guys that, all have phones phone, right? all in all d4 looks like it's going to be a fun game of course we're worried of course we're worried about monetization that blizzard's going to do or all the things that you know seem a little sketchy like the always online uh the forced multiplayer um the stuttering the servers there's a lot of things that i'm worried about um but the gameplay is really fun and i do think i'm gonna enjoy myself while playing this game before we go let's talk about the third world boss kill that i have i did two kills on stream then i did one here and then i did one later that night when even though i said i wasn't gonna do it uh, i did it <laughs> I have some worries when it comes to the world boss. Um, it might be for the fact that I've gotten used to the fight and I kind of know the move set, so it's super, super easy now. Um, now, granted, when she hits you, you pretty much die right now. Um, her blades literally, like, they hit you and then the poison kills you. But if you know the move set and you could dodge all her attacks, it's pretty easy. Um, and it's not even like hard to know her attacks. She has like five moves total. And that's the worry that I have. She has the move that she spins around. She has the move that she slams on the ground. She has a move that she stabs the ground with her blades and then pulls back. Um, and then she has things that she's able to put on the ground in a bite and a spit. And about 90% of that you could dodge by just being under her feet. And yes, she does move around quite a bit. But since we have this dodge mechanic and rogues have a dash mechanic and barbarians have a jump mechanic, it seems like we're dodging it super, super easy. The first time we did it, we didn't know the moveset and we died quite a bit. But as you see in the third one, I died twice, I think, and it was relatively easy. We got four legendaries for it and whatnot. And for being a world boss, you would think it's a lot stronger and tougher to fight. Uh, so that's my only real worry. I, I hope that this isn't just the only like difficulty of world boss where like there's only five moves and then it's like easy or even this one is just a toned down version of what we're going to experience later on um there weren't any even like any ads here and yes i could see how ads might be a little annoying especially with their jumps and their spits and you have to pay attention to multiple different things but that does add a little bit of difficulty to it so my takeaway for this boss is that it's fun i just like a little bit more challenge yeah thank you uh, for watching basically this is kind of a, a lot of my unfiltered thoughts of d4 and what i think about it it's basically my first like i said my first impressions um there's a lot more to discuss with this there's a lot more when it comes to the skill system and a lot more that comes to like other things in the game i try to do like a very brief overview to like kind of have a very quick idea of what it is uh, later on, I might do a little bit more in-depth uh, guide of what it is, but I, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, it's definitely something that I'm going to be playing when it comes out. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um, yeah, I've been Amatech. I do stream uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. So if you do want to come say hi over there, it's the same name. It's twitch.tv slash Amatech. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for watching and have a great day, guys.